I lived with my aunt's family in Tierra Santa during part of my year of mayhem between high school and college. Suburban San Diego seemed a far enough stretch from the parties in Minneapolis, and most of the chaos stayed behind. The cocaine spilled out on my roommate's desk by uninvited guests, the lingerie parties. But no nose is more keenly primed for trouble than that of a bored teenager in the suburbs. And there was no shortage of trouble raising young men nearby. My aunt was concerned. So it was in the form of a warning that my aunt, Dana, told me about her daughter, Catherine. Dana gave birth to Catherine when she was about my age and gave her up for adoption. She thought about Catherine all the time. She had written her a letter and the door was open for contact, but she didn't know whether she would ever hear from her daughter. That choice was firmly the choice of Catherine's family and Catherine herself. And in the meantime, my aunt would love her hugely, but imperfectly from a distance. It was about as good a cautionary tale as any, but the target audience was distracted. I escaped Tierra Santa intact, but eight years later, still in almost all ways alone, I gave birth to a daughter of my own. I felt I had more options than my aunt did, and times had certainly changed. My daughter stayed with me. In the meantime, Aunt Dana became an evangelical Christian. She left my grandmother's Episcopal church and took up with the rock, even before it assumed its current colossal form in Point Loma. Mealtime grace during visits became a lot longer. The Christian pop music station played continuously. She steered conversations to God as often as she could and even took up some pet Republican tropes, but stayed away from hair trigger topics like abortion and gay rights, knowing full well how rocky were those waters. Most of our extended family, including me, was unwaveringly liberal. We enjoyed each other as people, loved each other as family, but knew the limits. Yet to know Dana was to adore her. She was one of the funniest people ever in my life. I'd like to say she was fucking funny, but she hated swearing. She had the rare gift of igniting a room in laughter with just a look. She was wry without bitterness, could mock herself, her husband, and her boys with so much love, so much joy for their imperfections as well as their virtues. You'd follow wherever she went, even on non-ironic odes to Tim the Toolman Taylor's long-suffering wife because she also listened to you, actively listened, affirming gifts you never knew you had. Charismatic as she was, the rifts with Dana could be crushing. My ability to raise my own child bothered Dana deeply. I can't say this for sure, since she never said it in so many words, but there were signals. Soon after I had my baby, I ran out of money completely. Since my aunt and uncle had some means at that time, my mother urged me to ask for a loan. Dana agreed, but scoffed over the phone, contemptuous in a way I had never known her to be. Everyone thinks we have so much money. We don't. I hadn't thought that. I just needed help and didn't know what to do. When I was back on my feet, I called to let her know I'd be repaying her right away. Good, she responded. We'll donate it to the church. Two and a half years ago, my Aunt Dana was diagnosed with a stage four flamboyantly aggressive cancer. 
She and my uncle had moved away years before, and I only saw her three times during her illness. At the end of our last visit, as she was hospitalized by an injury that prompted her final decline, we said goodbye. From her prone position in the hospital bed, Dana gripped my hands, and she opened her blue-green eyes wide, and I felt like she was taking all of me with her, or as much as she could. She died Memorial Day this year. On October 2nd, Dana's daughter, Catherine, whom Dana had given up for adoption 38 years ago, contacted two of my cousins and my mother through Facebook to find out whether the Dana still connected to them on their profiles was indeed her mother. She was finally ready to know her. She missed her by five months. But through her grief, she was thrilled to find us and made plans to travel with her daughter and husband from San Jose to my cousin's house in Temecula this Thanksgiving. Catherine is a year younger than me. Her daughter is a year older than my daughter. And even though I am ardently pro-choice, I am forever grateful that the road to Catherine was not closed. This Thanksgiving, I joined my three cousins and their families to meet Catherine and her family. She looks just like Dana, just like her. She sounds like her. She is strong and fragile and funny all at once like Dana. And like me, she knows what it's like to raise a daughter alone in a too moral, rarely kind world. We gathered around the improvised banquet tables. It was the first holiday my cousins had shared since my aunt died six months ago. It was the first they ever shared as siblings, all of them. It was the first time I heard Dana's voice again with inflections of a different life. It was the first. That's Caroline Henry.